This is Stygian Sagas. Dark fiction, read by the author. Tonight, Xolotlan. Heading the linguistics department at the University of Clarksville has suited me well. It's a tiny but respectable school, and my long career there has been nothing shy of impeccable. The town of Clarksville, for which it was named, has been equally wholesome, the rolling hills and verdant trees of south-central Kentucky allowing for a mild, contented life. My attachment to that peace is what kept me silent for so long, holding my tongue for fear that wagging it might upset the delicate balance of the department. The kinds of claims telling my story in tales would be derided across the academic world, so I've kept quiet about what I experienced beneath Mexico some 40 years ago. Now, though, with the headsman's axe of stomach cancer weighing heavy, I feel the need to write it down, if only so I can grapple with what I've kept buried for so very long. I'll leave this account buried amongst my personal papers, to be stored in the university's archives. I'm under no illusions that what I write will be believed, should anyone ever bother to read it. I only hope it can serve to calm my nervous thoughts before the end. A crude leech bleeding, so I might leave this bad blood far behind me. The whole sordid account began in 1979, several years after I attained my tenure with the university. As a young academic, I'd homed in on pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, the cultures of ancient Mexico and Guatemala holding particular interest for me. I won some small renown in my field figuring out ciphers for several forgotten Mayan logograms whose meanings had been lost during the long Mayan collapse. The languages fascinated me, and I made it my business to dig into any undeciphered writing or glyphs the region offered up, no matter how insignificant they might seem to others. It was this willingness to chase any lead which attracted the attention of Javier Herrera, who contacted me that spring. Apparently associated with a modest local museum near the community of Tishtlancingo, Herrera was an amateur archaeologist with an interest in drawing tourism to his modest hometown. Having heard of my trip into cartel country the prior summer to fetch Toltec writing tablets from a tiny ruin, He'd wagered I was not averse to risk. He was correct, and I was thrilled rather than daunted by the risky proposition he had in store for me. Blind to danger and unconcerned with the slim chance of finding anything valuable, he'd found just the right foolish academic to ask. A recent landslide in the area had alerted several herders to a huge, newly opened chasm in the hills west of Tishtlancingo. Initially just a geological curiosity, the locals had become intrigued with the sort of obelisk they'd spotted in the depths of the pit. The pillar of preserved rock featured familiar Mesoamerican characters in several well-known native languages, apparently repetitions of the same prayer cycle in different tongues, a sort of Mesoamerican Rosetta Stone. One form of writing, though, was unlike the others. It was, Herrera told me, unlike anything he'd ever seen before, sure to be of interest to someone with an interest in obscure Mesoamerican linguistics. The pictures he'd mailed along proved as much, displaying a dimly alien pattern of elongated triangular markings which held no traces of anything familiar. This, along with several scattered chunks of masonry in the water nearby, led Herrera to believe there was a larger site lost to the depths. 
It was those depths that would make a survey dangerous, and whose unplumbed mystery would pull me along into the expedition. The chasm seemed to fall away for hundreds of meters, ridiculously deep. At its terminus, a cenote opened up, revealing a crystal-clear tube of azure water trailing away through the earth to depths unknown. To plumb it for artifacts or information would require a potentially risky diving excursion into the cave system. On top of the treacherous scramble down the chasm itself, Herrera needed a competent linguist capable of first translating whatever strange language decorated the obelisk and then managing the prodigious stress of the descent, in case more of the writing could be found below the surface. It goes without saying that I'd have accepted the invitation whatever the details might have been. The prospect of examining such an odd writing system, wholly unknown to the region, made my imagination soar. What really set me ablaze, however, was the glyphic representation of a bat's head which decorated the familiar panels of the obelisk. Though it had many names in many native tongues, it had only one meaning. This was the symbol of Xolotlan. If you are familiar with the idea of El Dorado, the mythic city of gold supposedly hidden away in the wilds of the New World, then consider Xolotlan a city of death, a less famous sibling to that city. The Aztec god of lightning and death was Xolot, his image most often that of a dog-headed man or a skeletal, bat-headed figure in priest's regalia. The Mexican hairless dog, Xoloitzquintli, to give it its proper title, is named for him. The breed was supposedly a gift from Xolot to mankind, given so that the dogs might lead their human companions on safe passages through the land of the dead into the subterranean underworld beneath. The near-forgotten crown jewel of this underground maze beneath the realms was Xolotlan, Xolot's temple city. I'm fond of the mythology, so much so I own two of the dogs myself. As such, I have a fascination with the seldom-mentioned, often-overlooked Xolotlan, Obscure tales told by certain arcane pre-Columbian texts of central Mexico say Xolotlan was a place to which those near death could make pilgrimage, a mighty subterranean metropolis in which half the buildings and structures were tombs and monuments, a rumor-shrouded place known only to the priestly castes of Mesoamerica's civilizations. Xolotlan and its caves were reportedly occupied by both human holy men and beings of the world of death. As such, they were safe only for those who were blessed with entry by the subterranean guardians of its anointed avenues. The mythology surrounding Xolotlan had been in shadowed existence long before the founding of Tenochtitlan and the beginning of Aztec expansion around 1325. Even the ancient Olmec have logograms reminiscent of Xolotlan, suggesting the idea of it was there from the very beginning, rising up in ageless millennia before agriculture came to Central America. Of interest to the Spanish were the rumored tombs, assumed to be rich in gold and turquoise, along with countless other rarities. It was to this obscure place that Herrera's miraculous obelisk made reference. There was no chance this tiny kernel of vague information would win over funding from the school or the local elite, leaving me to lean on my own savings. As I scrambled to book a summer ticket and scrounge together my modest funds for diving instruction and travel, I had no inkling of how momentous and terrible what we'd discovered would turn out to be. Excited as I was by this brazen new frontier, I boarded the plane to sun-scorched Acapulco that June with every intention of turning up no more than a pile of corroded gold relics and moldering bones, the refuse of a sacrificial pit. How wrong I was. How wrong we all were. Herrera welcomed me with open arms 
and we spent the first weeks of the month practicing for the coming dive in the crystalline waters off the resort-choked coastline. Emiliano Villafuerte, an old associate of Herrera's who'd aided during tours of the area, took on my instruction. He proved to be a capable and compelling teacher, especially considering the language barrier. Despite my knowledge of Mexico's native languages, I was paradoxically short on Spanish in those days, and Herrera had to act as a go-between during my time in Acapulco. This made the lessons a bit stifled, but we naively figured the dive would be as straightforward as any cenote excursion and forged ahead, blind to the tribulations lurking in the hills. All the while, I pored over rubbings which had been carefully taken from the obelisk, in awe of the intricate structure of the newfound language. It bore more resemblance to Mesopotamian cuneiform than Mexican writing systems, but the triangular wedges that composed the alphabet were cluttered and aggressive. Moreover, it seemed to be an alphabet of syllables rather than a writing system of pictographic symbols or logograms as with virtually all other Mesoamerican writing. The strangest feature was that they'd been formed of raised stone rather than impressions, the whole backdrop of the inscription having been painstakingly carved away from the letters. In this, at least, it reminded me of many other native writing systems, complex and likely meant only for a privileged elite of highly trained priests. The labor required to write in the tongue would prevent most lay people from even attempting it. We began to jokingly refer to it as Mexicaniform amongst ourselves, and despite its strangeness, I made excellent progress with the material we had available. Using the familiar Mixtec language as a guide, I worked out a visual system for reading the Mexicaniform which would come to serve me well below ground. Though there was no way to distinguish what noises the long-dead alphabet or logograms represented, the words could be understood easily enough. The inscription, a warning to what I assumed to be prospective priests, was shadowed and imposing, sporting all the Stygian menace common to Mesoamerican religion. A doom has fallen upon the lands of death, it proclaimed. A darkness lurks beneath which even mighty Sholot cannot endure. All has fallen to silence, and even silence has gone to seed. The lifeless city lies cold. Naught but the void awaits hither, and so shall it ever be. The words were eerie, seeming an attempt to ward off visitors. I'd never encountered similar passages before, for the underworld and its denizens were generally treated with reverence by religious texts. To see the city of death, ostensibly the fabled Xolotlan, referred to as anything other than an erudite scholar's paradise of temples and plenty, stirred the specter of fear in me. That fear would linger until our departure, and grow ever stronger during our long drive up into the mountains. More dry than tropical, the region was craggy and sheer, and each dip in the hills was choked with a sharp, gnarled green scrub that gnawed desperately for moisture in the parched earth. The trees were bent and scattered, leering over treacherous dirt roads like petrified witches in the afternoon glare. Every once in a while, a great gust of wind from the distant coast would sweep through the still highland brush making it dance and wave in a way that seemed to me almost malevolent. I said as much to Herrera and Villafuerte, and they laughed off my nerves, content to assume it was just the discomfort of a stranger in a strange land. Though the locals in the few villages we supplied in were hospitable and jovial, and the landscape was not terribly different to countless other regions around central Mexico, I found the hill country's eerie beauty grotesque. The best description I can give to the menace is to say it felt like the backdrop to a nightmare which I could only vaguely recall, or perhaps of one I had yet to dream. 
I'll leave the exact location vague for reasons that will become evident, though those few who were aware of our purpose in the academic sphere could likely piece it together. It is my sincere hope that, in the long years since, the locals have forgotten those strange days, and the academic contacts who knew the truth of our aims have passed on or fallen into obscurity. By the late afternoon, we'd come to a halt and went into the hills, bent under the weight of heavy containers and watertight bags. We began outside of a modest home, and, after exchanging pleasantries with the owner, made our way north along the property into a dip between the hills. Following the bed of a dry creek, we came into a deep scrub-choked vale surrounded by steep cliffs. At its heart, a giant rent had opened in the earth, a rocky mouth grinning back at the mocking sun overhead. The others suddenly seemed to share my apprehension, the region's leaden shadow weighing heavy on all of us as we anchored ourselves for the climb downward into the hole. With scraggly goats eyeing us suspiciously from the heights and the hateful wind dulled by the walls of the valley, we descended on secure lines along the stone. The crevice proved much deeper than I'd initially anticipated, dropping a thousand and more feet into the earth beneath the mountains before it terminated on the banks of a placid, crystal-clear cenote. The sun overhead was eaten whole by the towering rock of the walls, and the noise of the wind became a distant, muffled piping. Lights bouncing off jagged cracks and water-worn rock formations, I was taken several times by the notion that the massive pit all around us had been carved out by hand. The soft, angular shapes seemed too symmetrical and measured to be natural, despite the wear and tear of many countless years upon the stonework. I related these thoughts to Herrera and Villafuerte, but they told me they'd found no signs of hammer or chisel strikes in the stone. We reasoned it must be some accident of nature, like the famed Giant's Causeway of Ireland. What most certainly wasn't an accident was the obelisk itself, which I took to studying the second my dusty boots left the slope. Jutting from layers of long-dried mud on the cenote's shore, the tower was masterfully carved of delicate, condensed obsidian. Our flashlight beams splintered and fractured on its jagged, crystalline edges, an effect which combined with the cenote's still waters to create a dazzling light show. The thing was even more intriguing in person than those first grainy photos had suggested. Up close to the looming 18-foot obelisk, I couldn't explain how a pre-Columbian society could have found such a massive chunk of intact obsidian. They must have heated it, Herrera offered, his own eyes wandering the obelisk melted the different pieces together like glass. This I doubted. The civilizations of ancient Mexico were many things, talented craftspeople among them. They were not, however, great forge workers. To turn this much obsidian to slag, cool it in an unbroken block, and so elegantly carve into its surface would challenge even modern craftsmen. I suddenly wished I'd done more to rope an anthropologist or geologist from the university into this slipshod expedition. Glad as I am that no other professors or graduate students were dragged into that forgotten pit, their input would have been enlightening. As I stared down the imposing mass of that midnight dark stone, I was convinced that we were on the verge of something massive utterly beyond the scope of current New World archaeology. Still, as Villafuerte prepared our dive gear and did a preliminary scan of the clear water beside us, I assumed we'd have plenty of time to call in extra hands from universities across Mexico and the States that summer. This was, I told myself, merely an exercise in profiling. A chance to get the lay of the land so we knew what we were working with if it came time to bring others in on the discovery. 
Determined to scout out the cenote and ensure all was safe for us to proceed, Fiafuerte made one final pass of the water with his light before sliding in from the sheer edge of the pool, the ancient surface sloshing with disturbance it likely hadn't known for centuries. Herrera and I watched on from the shore in our wetsuits, the water shining in eerie turquoise when lit from below by Fiafuerte. He traced his way around the mouth of the large sinkhole just beneath the surface, some 300 feet in diameter, before pushing downward into the bowels of the cenote. Deeper and deeper he went, his light moving this way and that as he inspected the curved walls, until at last his light was little more than a flickering dot, a lonely minnow circling the basin of a megalithic well. Then, in a soundless blink of sudden darkness, it disappeared. Herrera and I waited, trading speculation about whether something was wrong. Four or five minutes later, just as we were beginning to agree that something had gone sour in the cenote, the distant light reappeared, bobbing up towards us excitedly as Villafuerte made his ascent. When he finally breached the surface, he ripped away his regulator and scrambled out of the water in a frenzy. We expected shock or fear, the atmosphere of the shadowy crag taking our thoughts to dark and foreboding places. Fiafuerte was ecstatic, however, tripping over himself to tell us what he'd seen in the sinkhole. There were tablets and inscriptions along the walls, he said, all in the same triangular script we'd found upon the obelisk. Then, the cenote bent sideways, some eighty or ninety feet down, with the tunnel sweeping off to the west. There was a light at the end, he said, faint yet undeniable. The passage was huge, easily navigable, perhaps even carved. We'd need to see it with our own eyes to believe the scope of it, he insisted. Though the ominous obelisk and the wailing wind above had grated on my nerves, I'd be lying if I tried to convince anyone I wasn't thrilled by Villafuerte's words. Herrera donned his tank and took up one of the watertight bags, as did I, the whole group reverberating with renewed excitement. We double-checked our oxygen supply, tested our lights, and slid beneath the surface. The water proved surprisingly warm and its clarity was beyond anything I'd ever experienced in similar sinkholes across Mesoamerica. Comfortable as it was, we made an effort to be efficient. Following Villafuerte as he led us to four tablets built into the submerged walls of the cenote, evenly spaced along the shaft. These two were made of obsidian, fixed by ancient artisans into perfect cubbies in the surrounding limestone by some unnameable method. We photographed the passages of Mexicaniform with a bulky old underwater camera Herrera wore fixed to his chest. I didn't want to expend valuable time translating them while our oxygen slipped away. Later examination has proved them to be chants or mantras, encouragement for initiates and pilgrims who might have made the deadly dive in ancient days unassisted by modern equipment. No human eye could have made out the writing this far down, leaving me to privately theorize they must be ritualistic rather than practical, lending an unseen helping hand during the most trying part of a pilgrim's journey. Once we reached the bottom, we found no ritual sacrifices or scattered offerings littering the floor. Rather, the smooth cenote was intersected with an angular square hall, perhaps fifty feet to a side. It cut a clean path through the stone for a considerable distance, the better part of a mile, before opening up on a distant, gleaming light, just as Villafuerte had claimed. As we illuminated its walls, my heartbeat rattled my ribcage, my breath coming ragged against the regulator as I grappled to rationalize what I was seeing. Otherworldly, angular carvings decorated the walls, depicting strangely proportioned pyramids and equally strangely proportioned men. 
The reliefs were captioned with long passages of the strange language its crafters had used, almost all of which contained the Mexicaniform rendition of the name Xolotlan. We nodded and gestured at each other in frantic excitement, mute but desperate to share our exhilaration at something so unprecedented. Herrera clasped Fiafuerte's shoulder, the gesture slow and clumsy through the water, a wordless congratulation on his find. Fiafuerte shook off the thanks, pointing to Herrera's camera and motioning towards the walls. No one protested, and soon we were swimming along the broad Cyclopean tunnel, lights flashing to and fro as the camera captured the artistry of what we assumed to be some forgotten pre-Columbian ruin. The carvings and the passages accompanying them depicted a group of pilgrims approaching the mythic Xolotlan, making offerings and obeisances as they went. They were led by the familiar figure of the Xoloitzquintli, the dog pointing their way with almost comically outstretched paws. Abstract and cubic as the carvings were, they became unsettling when the pilgrims met the residents of Xolotlan. The natives of the City of Death were depicted as tall, thin, and wide-eyed, eerie even through the lens of angular sculpture. They towered over men, their gangly limbs outstretched in cold acceptance, a distant elder welcoming its delinquent children with icy reluctance. They spoke or sang before their guests, capering in ritual dances, men from the surface praying or meditating in their shadow. Then, the priestly visitors from above would be sacrificed, carved open atop strange temples reminiscent of the classic Mesoamerican style so common upon the surface. By the time we'd photographed and deciphered our way to the farther end of the tunnel, our flashlights were no longer needed. The glow was almost blinding from here, such that we strained to make out what lay beyond the tunnel's mouth right up until we floated over the brink. Beyond, we saw something which outstripped anything we'd seen thus far, and which I'm sure most will denounce as nothing more than deluded hallucination, if, that is, they've believed anything at all. I wouldn't believe it myself if I'd not been the one to experience it. We emerged halfway up the angled walls of a mighty, artificial subterranean lake. The walls, like the massive tunnel through which we'd entered, were of carven stone, replete with abstract outlines and jagged, menacing reliefs. The lake bed, a hundred yards or more beneath us, was blanketed in a tall forest of bioluminescent weed and fungi which twitched and swayed in the superheated froth of thermal vents. They were a sickly, pinkish white, their glow making the seascape feel surreal and uncanny. Tube worms, like those that cluster around deep-sea volcanic fissures, surrounded these vents, and all amongst them fauna that would floor the most imaginative marine biologist made its home. Pale, spindly crustaceans swarmed over the smooth stone, plucking sustenance from the vents. Gargantuan albino fish hid amidst the weed, sluggish bottom feeders whose skeletons and organs were silhouetted through translucent flesh. Smaller, equally see-through minnows and darters drifted in schools through the open water and great pinkish stingrays like those that swim the Mekong River floated up from the floor to dance with them across the lake's otherworldly vista. All this was haunted by the bubbling thermal exhaust that plumed here and there to the surface as the vents belched and bellowed, obscuring our vision before dying away to let the lake glimmer clearly once more. It was a beautiful, arcane, freshwater seascape that would have made a fantasist weep. To this day, I think back on the life that even now must swim beneath the hilly countryside of western Mexico and try to work out the intricacies of that cave-born biosphere in my mind. In the moment, 
we all drifted to the water's surface far above, desperate to speak after so momentous a discovery, making to slip our mouthpieces free the moment our heads bobbed above the surface of the lake. What we saw above the water, however, stripped our words away before they could even be formed. The lake's calm, bubbling surface stretched off for miles, and the distant cave ceiling soared thousands of feet overhead. Mist from the warm lake formed vaporous clouds against the carved, stony sky, and colonies of chittering bats wove in and out of them like birds searching out a roost. Clusters of some strange fungal growth or lichen pulsed a sickly glow here and there from where they grew upon the ceiling, giving the impression of dull, winking stars through the imposing gloom. The cavern was titanic, larger than any known to humankind, so impressive in scope that it made our heads spin just to gaze upon it. This sensation was made all the more paralyzing by the fact that it all looked hand-shaped, taking the form of a monolithic, squat octahedron. At the lake's center, there rose a vast platform, an artificial island wreathed in mist. Massive towers and pyramids jutted like treetops from the shroud, looming black against the glimmering cavern ceiling. Their smooth sides reached up to that ceiling, often mirrored by identical structures which dropped down to meet them from above. It looked like a forest of angular, handcrafted cave columns, built in a style vaguely similar to Mesoamerican temple complexes, but infinitely more skilled. Even well-funded modern architects would struggle to replicate the structures in concrete, with all their machinery and logistical coordination brought to bear. This, I knew at once, was fabled in rumor-haunted Xolotlan, the mythic city of death given form, apparently not so mythic, after all. Once we'd gotten over the initial shock, I said as much to Herrera and Villafuerte. They were as exhilarated as I, all of us imagining the possibilities such a find offered up. There were the obvious material benefits to our careers, but I feel we were all much more excited about the staggering, awesome novelty of the discovery. If I'd stumbled across Atlantis itself, I'd have hardly been more pleased. Herrera stammered out a question, wondering whether we should go back and return with a more able team. Neither Villafuerte or I would relent, both of us arguing for a push into the city proper to get the lay of the land and know what we'd need for a return trip. There is a small part of me that laments that we did not turn around, as Herrera suggested. Perhaps he and Villafuerte would still be alive. I sincerely doubt it, however. If anything, a larger return trip only would have meant more dead. It is probably better for all of us that our expedition ended in failure and terror, and that I was left alone to dwindle, letting knowledge which should have remained forgotten slip away in deafening silence. Blind to the doom that waited for us, we swam for Xolotlan with a desperate explorer's glint in our eyes. There was perhaps half a mile of calm, open water to cover and the adrenaline made the undertaking seem easy. Though the towers looked ominous through the fog, the comfortable warmth of the lake and the peaceful, hushed atmosphere of the artificial cavern lulled us into a monotonous sense of isolation. Foolishly, we assumed ourselves to be safe, the sole truly dangerous visitors to a placid, poised remnant of a bygone age. We were soon to be corrected, harshly. Herrera, perhaps the most nervous of us, was the first to notice it. It took some time for him to decide it wasn't a trick of the light or the lake's slow currents, and by the time he called out it was already nearly below us. Even if we'd spotted it sooner, we were a fair distance from the city's low-slung stony shore. I doubt we'd have made the banks in time, even if we gave it everything we had. 
Herrera called out for us to look, drawing our eyes to the lake bottom. The fungal fronds and strands of weed were being rustled in a weaving, snake-like line, something darting through the growth unseen. The movement halted just below, leaving us to tread water in frightened awe for a moment before the weeds spat forth the thing which had lurked within them. The creature was pale and bony, translucent in the sickly light of the lake, I think it was a giant freshwater eel of some kind, though there's nothing like it known outside that forsaken pocket of wildlife in Xolotlan's bubbling waterways. Its flanks gleamed with luminescent dots of a pinkish hue, and its black eyes glinted atop a flat, snake-like head fixed on our position at the surface. Ascending with shocking speed, it opened that broad mouth unbelievably wide, its throat swelling and distending to accept its target. Poor Villafuerte had been in the lead, kicking absently out in front of us, and it was he the thing focused in on. The length of an oarfish and several times the width, it covered the intervening space with such blinding ferocity that it was more a blur in the water than a solid form. Though Villafuerte kicked and yelled, knowing what was to come, there was nothing he could do. He was snapped up in its mouth in one fluid motion, the thing breaching the surface like a leaping whale. It had swallowed him whole, and as it retreated back to the safety of the weeds below, we could see the dark outline of him thrashing and spasming through its ghostly, troglodytic flesh. Had Herrera not intervened, I would have floated there, mortified, until some other horror swam up from the deeps to take us. As it was, he pulled me along after him, shouting that we had to get out of the water. He had the good sense to tug the equipment along with us, keeping our bags close at hand. It was Herrera who first climbed from the water onto the sloped, stair-step shore of Xolotlan pulling me from the water close on his heels, sputtering and gasping. I vomited upon the stone, focusing only on the plain, gray rock beneath me as I gathered my racing thoughts. Herrera wasn't much better off. Shaking his head as he muttered Catholic prayers and pleas in shaken, hurried Spanish, there was nothing to hear his muttered desperation save the forgotten city of the dead, which cast its shadow over us in expectant, malignant menace. It took us some time to compose ourselves. The thought of returning to the surface through the glowing lake in light of what we now knew lurked beneath the weeds revolted us. With Villafuerte's loss, the expedition's aim had become survival. Feeling cornered, we resolved to examine some of the city around us and try to find another way to return to the surface. Only if all else failed would we try the waters again. Taking stock of the watertight bags, we realized the dried fruit and nutrient bars we'd brought would be limited, only enough for a few modest meals. We had only counted on one night in the cenote, and even rationing wouldn't extend that by much. The water of the lake, at least, seemed potable. With ample batteries, we were also not in danger of running down our lights. The area in which we stood seemed to be some sort of small-scale stone dock extending from the huge foundation of the city. Low, open-fronted buildings faced the water, empty and yawning, likely warehouses or storerooms of some kind. We shrugged off our cumbersome tanks and kicked off our fins, leaving them stashed at the base of a wall. While our wetsuits and the rubber-soled socks we were in weren't comfortable, we had no other options, and ended up trudging into Xolotlan sodden and trembling in the still air. The city itself was likely only a few miles squared, but it was a dense maze of interwoven streets and pillar-like temples. P. 
Pyramids or blocky housing rows would rise in steps from the floor, only to be met in kind halfway to the ceiling. Doors and windows seemed oblong, built for residents which weren't quite normal. Textured ramps served in place of staircases in most buildings, angled so steeply we could hardly make progress climbing them. Often, these ramps were mimicked on the structures built into the ceiling overhead, making our stomachs churn as we silently wondered what purpose upside-down walkways served. We marked our way with small, green pieces of a notebook's cover, the color striking against the muted grays, sickly whites, and unwholesome pinks of the city. It would be incredibly easy to get lost down one of the many claustrophobic alleys or avenues, and we were always conscious of our bearings. The first buildings we fully entered, a row of towers filled with what looked to be apartments just off the docks, were spartan and austere. The furniture was stone, simple but elegant, with any cushions or adornments long ago having rotten away. The ceilings were strange, tall to us but low by comparison with the doors and windows, parallel with the top of the entryways. Little copper and gold plaques decorated the walls here and there, displaying short prayers or passages of unfamiliar scripture in the upraised Mexicaniform text. These apartments climbed up ramps too steep for us to ascend, but we guessed they rose all the way to the cavern ceiling. Walking further down the dark street, we climbed the low steps to a brooding stone temple wreathed with reddish moss. Its interior was cavernous, high-ceilinged and decorated with solemn statues of Sholowitz Quintly which posed like the Egyptian sphinx on plinths along the walls. There was a large, intricate stone map of the city built into the floor of the temple its major buildings picked out with glimmering turquoise or jade. This was much more accessible to us, and when Herrera urged me to translate some of the religious reliefs upon the walls, we realized why. Working with the pins we'd stowed away in the dry bags, I looked over the tablets which were set into the walls above the map, taking note of words or letters which hadn't appeared on the obelisk. It took me a few nervous hours, sweating in the dark under Herrera's flashlight to get a rough translation, but by midnight I had my report. It told a very grim story. Whatever the denizens of Xolotlan were, this temple was not built solely for them. Offerings of the faithful were routinely sent down from the surface, they wrote and many of their recorded prayers were blessings meant to prepare these pilgrims for sacrifice. Men from major Mesoamerican cities would swim the cenotes, of which there were many, into the lake, then brave the waters into Xolotlan. Those that reached the shore would be ritually fed and clothed, fattened upon rich banquets like exalted kings, and then carved open in the temples of the city as tribute to Sholot, patron god of Sholotlan. The altars of the temple, stained a blackish-brown in unremembered ages, gained a new, imposing significance. There was a sort of macabre beauty to the place and the rituals it had hosted, but I couldn't appreciate it standing in the dusty remnants of that centuries-dead city below the earth. It was a far cry from the sunlit avenue toward the Pyramid of the Sun, and worse, the human beings who had been offered up here were offered by something which wasn't quite human. The more I looked at the reliefs of gangly, staring figures welcoming pilgrims to their doom, the more I was convinced that the residents of Xolotlan were far from ordinary. These were thoughts I didn't dare relate to Herrera though I'm sure he must have suspected as much. We had kept an inexplicable silence all throughout our wanderings here, whispering and miming to maintain the stifling quiet. There had never been any discussion of this, but attracting attention seemed somehow ill-advised, regardless of the fact that Eon-dead Xolotlan seemed derelict, 
haunted by no more than memories and dried guano. It felt as if the walls themselves watched us, as if the city were slowly awakening to the presence of outsiders upon its ancient streets. It didn't help that a moist, sonorous clicking had rung out here and there throughout the city, usually from high up, as if the noises came from the roof. I pinned this sound on the bats, and Herrera always demurred and encouraged my skepticism, but I could tell they still grated on him. He flinched whenever the sound reached us, reverberating through the long dead ruin like the smacking of chewed gum, and I couldn't blame him. We sketched out a little replica of the sculptured map on paper before walking down the treacherous old stairway, scanning the towers around us with suspicious eyes as we went. There was a massive, hourglass-shaped ziggurat at the city's center, visible in silhouette through the forest of crowded monoliths and buildings, and we headed that way. The ritual carvings gave us reason to believe there was a colossal stairway inside it, a metaphorical and literal connection to the world of lesser men above. It was our greatest hope of escape, and we were ever more eager to see the sunlight once more. It was perhaps an hour into this journey that we were interrupted, the painfully loud slap of our rubber boots upon the aged stone clattering to a noisy halt. First, a loud, wet clicking sounded uncomfortably close. Then Herrera, ever vigilant, had spotted it, pointing me towards the stalker. I had only just glimpsed it in the gleam of the flashlights we carried before it slunk backwards into the shadow, lurching like something out of a B-grade zombie movie. It was a silhouette, a head and shoulders pale as bone, which slid back behind a doorway into the mouth of a giant residential tower as our light struck its glinting eyes. I made some fuss about it being a large bat roosting in the ruins, but we both knew that couldn't be. It had been tall, leering, too identical in shape to the gangly figures immortalized in reliefs and faded murals as the builders of Xolotlan. Herrera asked how anyone could still be alive down here, and I reminded him of the ominous inscription on the obelisk. Not but the void awaits hither, I thought as we drew the tiny knives from our kits and pressed towards the house. So shall it ever be. There was nothing inside beyond tumbled pottery and dusty stone furniture. The tunnel-like ramps and chutes leading higher into the tower were there, though mocking us with their shadowy mouths in the artificial light. Anything could hide beyond, and we'd have no idea. We resolved to hurry on. We'd speculated about finding a place to bed down as the night wore on and we grew more exhausted, but the sighting of the thing that hid in the tower put an end to all that. There was no dawdling or speculation now, only a hurried trot towards the distant ziggurat. Still, we made our best effort to keep our noise to a minimum, eyes darting from window to window or scanning the cloudy heights of the city along the cave ceiling. It didn't help. The smooth streets of the city were often denoted with names at intersections in inlaid quartz or glass of some kind, occasionally marred by bat droppings or creeping moss. All of these were unfamiliar to me perhaps great figures or events in the city's history. They caught the lights of our flashlights when we flicked them on now and again, and we flinched each time they threw stray beams up into the heights of the city among the towers. Every few minutes, a soft repetition of that weird, sonorous clicking came tumbling through the streets, untraceable as we snapped our heads up and down looking for whatever lurker had made the noise. Ten jumpy minutes into our walk, Herrera spied a pair of uncanny figures hanging upon a walkway between towers far above us, their arms outstretched like chimps as they clutched the rung of the bridge. At first, we thought them to be human-shaped ornaments or sculpture, marble against the jet-black shadow of the stone. 
when another pale form slid insect-like from an adjoining window and crawled along the bottom of the dark bridge, we ceased making excuses. A clicking sounded from a place in the towers far behind us, and it was answered by the group in front, agitated and hurried. Our hearts leapt as similar sounds rang out near and far, low and high, all across Xolotlan. The figures were too distant to make out details, but their eyes told us all we needed to know. Saucer-like and glinting in the cavern's surreal, fungal, ambient light. We debated in whispers whether to draw back down the streets the way we had come or continue on, trusting they would keep their distance. The decision was made for us, though. There was a shuffling behind me, hardly audible, miraculously picked out amidst my huffy breathing and the fluttering of distant bats far above. Herrera stood between me and the thing hanging from the bridge, so perhaps subconsciously I felt most vulnerable at my back, listening for any sound that might herald danger. In any event, I threw a glance over my shoulder, only to drag Herrera by his shoulder into a stumbling, desperate run. In our wake, a dozen or more of Xolotlan's misshapen people sprinted in a hopping pursuit, pouring from alleys and sliding from windows down walls with the grace of acrobats. Their strange, long limbs contracted and leapt. Hops and crawling jogs punctuated their run, so that the hunters looked almost clumsy despite their speed and fluidity. Still, there was no denying that they were masters of their environment, navigating sheer rock walls like crouching spiders only to drop to the ground and sprint like men. Herrera followed as I made a gamble, passing under the bridge from which the first watchers hung. They were already swinging down towards the ground, leaping from window to balcony to window, desperate to reach us before we could get by them. They made ear-splitting, whooping screeches that cascaded down the stony streets like floodwater, and the demoniac chorus of responses they received made our blood run cold. We didn't have time to ask in those harried seconds where the pursuers had been, or how they could have let the city degrade so much while they still lived. We thought only of escape. Slipping past the bridge, I caught a good view of one of the hunters as it landed in an animalistic crouch off to my right. Its head was skeletal, noseless and grinning, golden eyes massive and bred for the dark. Tall, nude, emaciated, translucent, Ribs were gray outlines against white flesh, and darkened veins pulsed down willowy, tapering limbs. Herrera must have gotten an equally intimate view, and the twisted sight spurred us on. As those pallid, overstretched caricatures of human beings clamored like hyenas at our backs, we burst from an adjoining street onto a wide thoroughfare, perhaps a mile long which led to the base of the ominous central ziggurat. Once, it might have been a grandiose vista, a horticultural crown jewel of the city. If it had once been a fitting tribute to the revered psychopomp Sholot, it was now as forgotten as the deity who inspired it. In years past, a strange garden of exotic subterranean fungi, likely manicured and tastefully maintained, had fallen to the same neglect which had worn down the rest of this terrifying, proud city. Fern-like fronds of a fleshy, dim red fungus glowed all ground, many having eaten through the stone of the streets. Taller clusters of bone-white stalks seemed to flicker like dying lamps in the gloom. Lazy, fattened fireflies nearly the size of cicadas hummed from mushroom to mushroom, alighting on pale branches and sickly-smelling fungi. The whole ground was a kind of rotten, stinking morass, filling our nostrils with a punishing stink like ammonia. The garden-turned swamp might have been a paradise for the strange life which sprouted there, but it revolted us on a primal, unspoken level. Herrera actually stuttered in our run, swerving on his feet as he involuntarily retched 
the stink hitting him head on. I pulled him along with me as I passed, barely holding it together myself, ever conscious of the yells and all-too-familiar clicks shadowing us up the thoroughfare. We kept wide of the thickest of the fungi, sticking to the overgrown road, closer to the towers lining the thoroughfare than the gleaming core of the rotten forest. Whatever repulsion we felt, it couldn't keep us out for long. A crude stone spike or spine, barely a blur at the edge of my vision, whipped past Herrera, thrown from somewhere above and ahead of us. It had missed him by inches. Almost as soon as we registered how close he'd come to death, another projectile was loose from behind, whistling by my ear. Herrera, seeing that there were pale figures running out from the towers between us and the central ziggurat, moved towards the forest. A rock grazed my head as I ran, sending a warm flood down my cheek, but I was too focused to feel any more than the dull thump of it. Herrera was hit too, stricken in the back by several stones as we wove through the first of the vile fungal ferns, but he carried on unfazed. The strange, fleshy leaves of the dusty mushroom growth whipped past in a blur. The buzz of flies and the wet thump of our feet in the mire's mud and guano floor filling my ears. Herrera called out to me, and I was fortunate he did so, for my vision was severely impaired by the glare of the glowing bog. Without those calls to guide me, I might have been separated from him on the move. It was only when we tumbled upon the banks of a stagnant and fly-clouded pool at the core of the garden, gasping and lightheaded, that we realized we'd left our pursuers behind. Initially, we were relieved, as Herrera examined the gash across my skull, deciding it was better to leave it than risk washing it in the vile water of the bog. The two of us began to regain our wits. It didn't take long for me to question why our pursuers would give up so easily, their cries and clicks lost beyond the buzzing symphony of the mushroom groves. Perhaps the grove was poisonous, we reasoned. We hadn't experienced any reaction to the growth beyond our initial repulsion, but that didn't mean we weren't in for a nasty surprise down the line. Much as that thought frightened us, we could hardly go back out into the open with the chittering horde of cave things. Trapped with no good options left to us, we resolved to walk along the bog's central pool towards the ziggurat, hidden from the pale things outside by the crowded fronds and stalks. We never let our guard down, our eyes sweeping every row of fungus or ruined hunk of masonry for any sign of danger. It was no easy task. Our eyes teared up at awful stenches and gaseous clouds filled with swarming gnats, all while the luminescent ranks of mushrooms pulsed and shimmered. The acidic air seemed to waver before us like asphalt beneath a hot sun, and our vision seemed lagged, with silhouettes remaining superimposed over our eyes long after we'd moved past the stump or mud bank in question. Soon, our heads throbbed and ached with the effort of trying to reconcile such a deluded, surreal landscape, blunting our ability to reason clearly. Herrera and I took turns in the lead, the follower keeping their hands fixed on the former's shoulders while shutting their watering eyes against the fumes. This way, we kept just enough sanity about us to make sure we were headed in the right direction. One sodden boot in the mud led to another, and though I can't say how long we slogged through the shit and grime in the garden, we eventually stood in the shadow of the ziggurat. It was little more than an outline through the glowing canopy overhead, but its bulk was unmistakable. I was following when Herrera pointed the temple out to me, spurring me to pry open my eyes and look past his shoulder. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was rustling through the fungal fronds to the side, though, my gaze snapping from Herrera's outstretched finger to the wavering half-shapes I saw in the garden thickets. I was rasping a warning, coughing out to him through the monotonous droning of buzzing insects, 
when something broke through the mushrooms into the open. I have no clue how such a thing came to exist. Maybe the properties of the air in Xolotlan are different than those above the surface, permitting growth at a rate unknown in the wholesome air of the upper earth. In any event, it couldn't have been a hallucination. That was my first thought when I saw it, that it must be some mirage born of the foul air and the flickering glow enveloping us. Mirages do not kill. They might mislead or confuse, but they don't tear a man limb from limb. Skittering from a bank of dense fronds just to the side of the pool came a praying mantis, pale and floral, glowing with all the brilliance of the bog in which it hunted. It was difficult to track its fleeting motions against the backdrop of the swamp, for its camouflage was excellent, but we could immediately tell it was no normal animal. It stood fully as tall as our shoulders. It came silently, making no sound save the light sucking of its limbs sinking into the mud. We both reeled, scrambling along the bank, desperate to center our wavering vision and attempt an escape. The first noise to truly break the white noise of the rotting garden was Herrera's scream. The only thing which saved me was that, by chance, it exited the foliage nearest to Herrera. Had he been in the rear, it would have been him that reached the ziggurat on trembling feet. As it was, the mantis from the bog dug its scything limbs into him, one around the torso and another around the shoulder. I saw it pluck Herrera's arm off like a flower petal as I slipped past, shrieking into the stalks of the swamp. I didn't try to fight, though I'm sure I couldn't have done more than get myself torn apart alongside him. Still, that doesn't do much to numb the guilt. His cries lasted for several minutes, haunting every step of my flight from the fungal forest. With each footfall, I thought another of the mantis things would burst out to take me. I believe I spotted several more in the corners of my vision, prying through stalks or perched upon gigantic mushrooms, but I can't be certain these weren't nervous fantasy. Projections meant to whip me into motion. Regardless, I exploded outward onto the thoroughfare at the foot of the ziggurat and managed to pound out the last few yards to its base before I collapsed in frantic exhaustion. I have no time scale for how long I lay there, half conscious as the haze of the bog lifted, but it couldn't have been more than an hour. I'm amazed to this day that the pale natives didn't finish me off while I was laying senseless on the stone. I suppose they dismissed us as lost, clueless victims of the overgrown garden and its deadly inhabitants. Based on what I was to learn soon after, it's possible they simply didn't recall we'd been there, though that's rampant speculation. Whether by fortune or some other conspiracy of factors, I opened my eyes within reach of our goal, alone. The ziggurat itself seemed to glower down upon the labyrinthine metropolis, a giant black gateway at its center topping a massive bank of steep stairs. Like much of that dead, devouring city, it looked like a waiting maw, prepared to swallow up and vomit forth sacrifices after a long and thirsty hiatus. A dark, Ancient stain down the center of the stairway spoke to the streaked blood that had been left there in aged, forgotten days, when Shulotlan still hummed with more wholesome life, if such a word can be used to describe so otherworldly a place. Behind it, the pallid fungus of the ceiling shimmered through the mist like a sputtering sun, backlighting the temple with a frigid, repulsive light. This, then, was the place to which pilgrims from the surface had been brought in ages past. I gathered myself, only then realizing I'd lost my bag somewhere along the escape through the bog. All I had to my name were the small knife and the flashlight, both clutched tight during the tumbling struggle in the swamp. That, and Herrera's camera, 
which we'd passed between us during the blind navigation through the mire. Whatever sliver of awareness had remained in that miasmal garden had told me to keep them close, and I resolved to conserve the light's battery as best I could. Slowly, agonizingly so, I crawled up the treacherous incline of stairs. Every shaky step I thought I'd hear that familiar clicking and screeching start up amidst the towers of the city. Though my eyes strained at every squealing bat and distant splash in the placid lake, I only heard a few distant clicks, and they never grew nearer. That fact didn't make the climb easier, each lunge upward reminding me how tumultuous the night had been, and how close to death I'd come. I refused to relent now, no matter how exhausted I was. When I did finally come face to face with the dark, open doorway atop the stairs, that resolve was pushed to its limits. The glum light of the fungus on the cave roof reached only a few feet past the entrance, and the blackness beyond was impenetrable to my eyes. Flicking on the light, I steeled myself as best I could and pushed inside. What I found within was a charnel house. A great square chamber with a depressed floor met my feeble light, tunnels and platforms leading up or down from the main room into the upper and lower segments of the massive temple. All along the floor, caked in the undisturbed dust of centuries, the bones of countless thousands rested in hunched, desiccated preservation. These were, of course, no normal corpses. They were the mounded bodies of Xolotlan's cave-dwelling dead, rank upon rank leading to a central altar, behind which the foot of a mighty stairway rose towards the ceiling. The stone ceiling above the stairway was flat, I could see, crushing my hope of a simple ascent from the ziggurat. It took me some time to recover from that disheartening discovery. After a minute or two staring over the dead, I made myself move forward, weaving along the rows towards the altar. A diademed holy man of some kind lay splayed in death before the altar, his skeletal arms outstretched towards an obsidian tablet. On it I found an inscription in the script of Shalotlan, an epitaph as it turned out, for the mighty city upon whose corpse I stood. The tablet told of a blight that had come to Xolotlan, a fungal infection which took root in the sinuses and climbed into the brain. This was anathema to them, for it was not one of the many familiar edible or functional glowing fungi of the cavern, but a strain from the surface. They speculated it had been brought down with one of the pilgrims, using terms which have rough anatomical and mycological analogues in our own languages today. The ill lost their higher functions, falling to irreconcilable rage and barbarism. The clawing death was what the priests had called it, and its ravages had left Xolotlan isolated and reeling, faced with an internal enemy they could not fight. The city of Xolotlan had been cut off from other great cities of the depths, the tablet making references that reminded me of the mythic Shambhala of Vedic legendary. They had sealed off the roots to the surface, warded off the pilgrims of the overworld with obelisks telling of the city's doom, and gathered in the heart of the ziggurat. Here, the lingering survivors had ended themselves en masse with a potent poison of the priesthood's devising, one final show of devotion to Sholot that he might shepherd those amongst his children who still had their minds into eternity. The staring, yelping things in the city made sense now, as did the yawning, unkempt garden. The landslide which had started all this had torn loose a barrier erected in centuries past, one meant to seal the city away. We'd been drawn, clueless and excitable, right into the depths of a nightmare, a modern parody of the ancient pilgrims whose feet had trodden upon these same temples. 
Did the illness, which had twisted the strange denizens of Xolotlan, impact human beings in the same way? How many of the zombie-like revenants in the city bred amongst themselves and clung to life, chittering and grasping in the dark corners of a city they no longer understood? How many other enclaves might even now exist in the depths of the Earth's crust, teeming with humanity's strange subterranean relatives? All these questions assailed me, but slowly one rose to the surface of the mire, bringing clarity to my racing vision, giving me a tangible goal for the first time since reaching the ziggurat. There had to be a secret behind the perfection of Xolotlan's stonework. The clean lines of the sealed passages to the surface were beyond any traditional stonemason. The cap which blocked the stairway at the ziggurat's center was like smoothed concrete, as if the limestone had been shaped and flattened like clay. The texts in the earlier temple had made exalted reference to something called stone mold in relation to the priesthood, and I dismissed it as some kind of mythic wordplay about religious stonework. The tablet in the ziggurat, though, had mentioned it in a way that made me certain it was a substance, not an art form. This was some kind of tool the people of Xolotlan used in elder days to perfect the shaping of stone. Weaving down perilous ramps and crawling along rough-bottomed tunnels into the depths of the ziggurat, I strained to find more references to the stuff, desperate for anything which might help me break the seal on the temple and see the clean air of the surface world again. As I stumbled through ossuaries and monument chambers for the city's honored dead, my light played across opulent royal tombs and decadent sarcophagi that would have stripped my breath from me under other circumstances. I could give them little attention now, feverish in my desire to escape the place I'd been so intrigued by for so long. I feared that I might stumble on one of the infected natives in the temple's bowels, but those fears never manifested, making me think some revenant of their old faith kept them wary of the intimidating structure. Though many years had been spent dwelling on the myth of Xolotlan, I wanted nothing to do with it now, not after I'd looked it in the eye. My only focus was escape and I was fortunate enough to find my route not long after, emerging onto a shadowed canal running under the base of the temple. This, it seemed, was a transit line for the priesthood. It ran from side to side beneath the ziggurat, probably restricted and well-guarded in Xolotlan's golden ages. Now, only dust and minnows from the lake made the tunnels home, leaving me to explore in relative peace. I walked along the flat banks of the canal, shining my light into alcoves that cropped up every so often along the walls, until I found myself face to face with my salvation. One of the alcoves was filled with casks of a sort of slick clay. On the sides of these casks, the lettering of Xolotlan spelled out stone mold in careful, pristine characters. I'd wager there was some kind of chemical or plastic lining on the casks, another advanced secret of Xolotlan, for within it was a kind of mild, clear acid. Perhaps that isn't the best word, but it is the only one that springs to my layman's mind. It had no odor, and it wasn't stored as if it was dangerous to the touch. I certainly didn't test that, though. Rather, I poured several cautious drops onto the limestone of the canal walkway, the stuff steamed for several long moments, like hot water under cool air, before falling mute. Prodding the spot with the rubber toe of my wetsuit, I found the stone spongy and malleable, like clay before firing. I've marveled at this for years. I've tried to consult chemists on the matter, but approaching the question without telling the whole maddening story has proved impossible. Without a sample of the stuff to examine, they're as incredulous as you'd expect them to be. The speed and impact of the substance, especially when compared with the tame, odorless nature of it, has proved indecipherable. 
another secret which will hopefully lay silent with the builders of Xolotlan for many centuries to come. Across the canal, in the opposite alcove, two remarkably well-preserved canoes were moored against the wall. At first, I marveled that wood would remain whole for so long while floating in the lake's warm waters, but then my light met the bottoms, and they shone beneath the beam. They were of a pale, likely fungus-based planking endemic to the caves, warped in places with age. The bottoms were something else, though, lacquered with some kind of quartz-like film that glimmered and reflected the surfaces beneath and beside it. For a moment, I struggled to piece this together, but the frenzied events of the night fell into place for me, and it all made sense at once. With these, the priests might row the waters of the lake in safety, with the gleaming forests on the lake floor making the boat shine bright against the glowing fungus of the cave ceiling. From below, I reckoned, the creatures in the lake would see little more than glimmering light. There would be no detailed dark shapes to pick out against the sickly glow of the cave's omnipresent, fungal daylight. Whatever the coating was, it must have had a slick plastic veneer, not unlike the lining of the casks in which the stone mold was stored. Rethinking my route of escape, I reasoned that the way I'd come in was the surer bet, and packed several casks of stone mold onto the sturdiest of the canoes. Then, taking up a warped old oar from the wall, I pushed down the canal and into the light of the open city, praying this last leg of the journey went along without disaster. I made a heart-stopping, sluggish trip around the outskirts of the city, worrying at every moment that the muted breach of my paddling would draw up some monster from the bottom. I saw nothing terrible break through the weed and fungus beneath, but I spied a few of the looming natives hanging from temples and balconies as I passed. They simply watched, curious and silent. I brushed up against the dock we'd first encountered just long enough to grab my tank and fins, eyes always on the heights of the buildings nearby in case the infected made another run for me. Herreras likely sit there to this day, gathering dust in final testament to our awful intrusion into that overgrown crypt. Then it was off onto the water again, making for the far wall of Xolotlan, basking in the light of that pestilent, mist-wreathed cavern for one final time. When the prow of the canoe brushed the angled wall of the cavern, I prepared my exit. Donning my fins in the tank, I readied my gear as best I could and ensured the water between me and the entryway beneath the lake was clear. I then lined up the canoe with the tunnel, trying to keep myself directly above the aperture. I had one final gift for the departed city. Taking up one of the casks, I made my gamble, dousing the wall with stone mold. The rock steamed just above the surface, running like heated wax, breaching the water and rolling at a snail's pace down the angled wall like magma. I repeated this with all the casks I'd been able to fit on the boat, getting a good slide of the liquid stone underway before I slipped over the edge of the water and made for the tunnel. I hope the stone mold kept going, despite the water. It seemed to be eating up the hundred feet or so between the surface and the tunnel in a pudding-like wave when I passed by it but I can't say whether the strange chemical actually caused a big enough schism to close off the entryway through which we'd come. I swam at speed, every moment imagining some twisted eel or malign octopus swimming up the tunnel behind me, pushing me to kick ever faster. The ascent to the surface and the scramble out of that sinkhole onto the star-lit and valley floor as a haze, made blurry by fright, disbelief, and the dying veil of adrenaline. I lay there for some hours, stripped of my wetsuit, sitting in the ragged clothes I'd hiked out in. I must have looked so out of place, wild-haired and wild-eyed, staring off across the hills like a shell-shocked soldier. Only the meandering goats and wandering lizards witnessed all that, though. When I stumbled into a nearby house soon after sunrise, rambling about Villafuerte and Herrera, I was almost delirious. 
The next days were a haze, a panoply of reports to local authorities about a diving mishap in the tunnels beneath the cenote. I never tried to communicate to them the full scope of what awaited us down there, even in my most rambling moments. I was never foolish enough to think they'd believe, at least not without seeing it for themselves. Whether anyone did or not, I can't say. I left Mexico the following week, shaken and disheartened, and I never heard from anyone official in connection with the tragedy. Perhaps my slipshod plan to close the tunnel worked. Maybe they trusted my word, consigning the sinkhole to obscurity as a dangerous death trap and leaving it to rest undisturbed at the bottom of that valley, forgotten. Neither of those options seem likely, though. I often worry there is some awful epilogue to my own experiences known only by whatever unfortunate military dive team or state-funded expedition they sent stumbling into that abandoned madhouse. Despite those worries, whatever the authorities uncovered down there, if they've found anything at all, they've kept to themselves. This is as it should be, by my reckoning. There are some places it would be better not to disturb. As it stands, my career has been productive and I'll be remembered by a dedicated few in my field for many years to come after I'm gone. That's all I can ask. I'm happy to let Shalotlan rest firmly in the past, where it should have remained all along. Some nights, though, I take out Herrera's photographs, which I eventually dared to develop. I unfurl that old rubbing from the obelisk and stare over the strange, angular characters of Shalotlan's long-dead language. I wonder why the fungal strain which devastated the city's troglodyte population had no noticeable effect on me, no matter how many years slipped by. I wonder about the strange tunnel maps on the ritual chamber walls in the ziggurat, about rumored subterranean cities from the familiar Grand Canyon to the distant Himalayas. I wonder about the references made to rival gods and enemy nations in the annals of Shololan's temples and what they mean for the wider world. Myth cycles in Asia and pre-Christian Europe described similar cave-dwelling things. The more I dig into obscure bits of legendry, the more I'm convinced I've only spotted the tip of an iceberg, submerged and lost to human memory. A distant acquaintance employed at the Kansas City World War I Memorial once told a colleague about an encounter he'd had with a tall, pale, staring man outside a mine in eastern Kentucky, not far from my own doorstep. Could this Lawton stalker be related to the things which chased me down the avenues of Xolotlan all those years ago? I've never had the stomach to do more than wonder. I will, however, endeavor to leave the whole of my collected rubbings, pictures, and ciphers amongst my papers. If someone ever uncovers something related to some other nearly human construct beneath the surface, they might come in handy. Otherwise, consider them trifling curiosities, and this account a stress-induced false memory, fueled by a mind too steeped in archaic lore and shadowed mythology. I've certainly tried to do so, but maybe the readers of these ramblings will find more success than I have. I head to my end with my pet Shalowitz quaintly curled at my feet. Hopefully, whatever afterlife awaits me, if indeed one does, is beneath an open sky. Just in case, though, the hounds of Sholot will have me covered. <laughs>